Hello students, I wanted to take the opportunity to review some of the points from um, diabetes. Um, I went over um, a quite a few, quite a bit of information, um, but I want to go back over some information from yesterday um, that you may have reviewed on the video. And so these are some things that I wanted to talk about here. Diabetic sick days, um, DKA, HHNS, diabetic foot care and um, checkups. Um, with, with sick days, um, there was a little chart in your book that talked about diabetic sick days. What I really want you to remember um, about sick days is that when a patient has sick days, they are not to stop or not to discontinue their medication. Um, and the the plan of care, as I've already told you before, is going to be going to be individualized to each patient. But it's going to be very important that our patients know that when they're sick, when they're ill with the flu or a stomach virus, that it is going to be essential that they monitor their blood pressures at this time. Um, in periods of stress or illness, um, they are still going to have, um, still going to require their insulin. And so um, the reason for that is, is that um, Whenever we have any type of str when we have stressors on the body like illness, um, fever, um, different sicknesses, what that does is it causes the release of um, hormones. It causes counter regulatory hormones to be released. Once those hormones are released, they cause the secretion of glycogen. Um, and so we learned about what happens when the liver releases glycogen it causes the release of glucose. So even though the person is sick, even though they're not feeling well, not eating, not drinking, they may think, well, I don't need to give any I don't need to give myself insulin because I haven't eaten anything. Well, that's not right because as I said, those hormones are still going to be released because of that stress response and it's going to cause the um, blood sugar to go up. And so this is why it's going to be essential that the patient knows to monitor their blood sugars every 2 to 4 hours um during periods of illness. And so um the person also wants to make sure that they're testing their urine for ketones when they're sick as well. And if the urine is positive for ketones, they need to contact their physician. Um, and so whenever the person... Um, Whenever the blood sugar is greater than 250, this is when the patient should begin to check their urine for ketones. But definitely we don't want them to stop taking their insulin. Even if they're vomiting and not able to eat, they may even require additional insulin. So this is why it's important for them to know to monitor and to also call their doctor to see if any adjustments need to be made. At this time, it's important for them to make sure that they're taking in their carbohydrates. This may not be the time for us to stress that um, diet drink. They can drink a regular soda, Gatorade. We just want to make sure that they are um, they that the blood sugar um, levels um, don't um, don't get out of hand. So if they're not able to eat. At that point, you know, we want them to, as I said, make sure that they're drinking so that they don't become dehydrated. Okay, so outside of that, let's say that this person was sick, they had the flu, they didn't eat, um, and so the person began to, you know, um, not feel so bad, not feel so good, and, and, and even began to feel worse. Um, we have a condition here that we call um, that's called diabetic ketoacidosis. Um, we tend to see diabetic ketoacidosis happen more often in our type one diabetics because, as we learned on yesterday, the type one diabetic is not secreting any insulin at all. So. Um, for that person, their bodies are going to break down fat stores for them, um, and then. Um, when that happens, it puts them in that um, state of ketosis. So when we look at um, diabetic ketoacidosis, some risk factors for developing it is the person taking too little insulin or skipping doses of insulin, um, or maybe the person has developed an insulin resistance. So um, the, all those are a number of reasons that a person can develop ketoacidosis, but um, 
when we have a person that has ketoacidosis, what does this look like? Well, we can tell one part of it, the person is going to have um, excessive acid. So they're going to um, have, we know they're going to have a breakdown of those, of, of those um, fat stores, which is going to put them in a state of ketosis. But outside of that, they also develop acidosis or metabolic acidosis is what we actually see with this person. So if you can re remind your rewind your minds all the way back to when we learn fluid and electrolytes and acid base balance when we have a person in there in a the state of acidosis you have this influx of those hydrogen um, ions um, and so when we said when we had that influx of that acid it pushed potassium out of the interest um, out of the um, out of the intracellular space and pushed it into the bloodstream. So when we have a person that has diabetic ketoacidosis, we're treating a number of things. We're treating the ketosis, the person has metabolic acidosis that develops, and they um, will also possibly have problems with hyperkalemia. So quite a bit is going to be going on with this patient. And also remember when we have patients that have elevated blood sugar levels, which is what we see with the person with diabetic ketoacidosis, we still have the three P's, polyuria, the person may be, um, they may have some thirst and some hunger, but this person is at risk for becoming dehydrated and that's going to be a problem for this patient. Um, due to that excessive glucose level what may cause them to be nauseated um, they may vomit more and then something that we may notice with this patient as well is a change in their respiratory rate they may have increased rate and depth of their respirations because they're trying to blow off that acetone and so if you smell this person's breath it's going to smell kind of fruity they're trying to blow off some of that acid so um, when we have this person, we've got to do a number of things. We've got to correct the person's electrolyte imbalance because, as I said, this person, um, um, because of the metabolic acidosis, is going to develop hyperkalemia. But also, we have to remember that they may have lost chloride ions if they were um, vomiting as well. So we've got to closely monitor this person's electrolyte, but um, we've also got to replace electrolytes as well. So of course, we know you know for potassium, we're monitoring EKG levels, monitoring the person for you know cramps, anything like that. Um, we have to make sure that we're um, Trying, we're going to um, rehydrate this patient, which is going to be really important um, with IV, flu, IV infusions of um, normal saline, half normal saline. And um, we've got to, uh, you know, be aggressively um, rehydrating this person over the um, first 24 hours. We've got to make sure that we're keeping up with the person's intake and output. If the person's renal function has declined, we cannot give the person potassium. So we have to make sure that we're monitoring the eyes and nose, making sure that the um, urinary output is adequate before we give the person IV potassium. So... Um, Usually, if the person does not have any um, any urinary problems, we are going to start a, infu a potassium infusion. Um, and it's just going to depend on how much, how... Um, how low the person's potassium level is depending on how much um, or how quickly they will infuse that potassium. Um, also, in addition to um, infusing potassium, we've got to correct the pH imbalance. We said this person is in acidosis, so um, usually what we um, when we have a person that has too much acid, we want to add some type of base to that. So this person um, may need a will probably need um, a sodium need sodium bicarb to correct the blood pH. Also, we may find that this person is going to be on an insulin drip. Um, and usually, the, uh, if we start off with a low-dose insulin therapy, maybe 5 to 10 units per hour. Please remember that regular insulin is the only insulin that can be infused um, via IV drip. And so usually, we will start that. Uh, we'll, the person will receive a bolus initially of 0 0.15 unit per um kilograms so we know how to convert pounds to kilograms and then you multiply that times 0 0.15 and so that's about how much the person is going to receive um, 
in an initial bolus. So how are we going to treat this patient again? We've got to rehydrate the person. Normal saline, maybe half normal saline, we're going to um, aggressively rehydrate them. We've got to make sure that we're monitoring intake and output. We've got to make sure we're doing that before we can give the person potassium. We've got to give them potassium and continue to monitor the person for those um, problems that are associated with hyperkalemia. We've got to correct the pH and also administer insulin to this patient as well. Okay, and so what are we going to do? We want to prevent recurrence. Um, this person may have, you know, like I said, this person may have been sick and decided, you know, I don't feel well, I don't need insulin because I'm not eating. We learned that that is not true because the glucose um, levels um, may continue to rise when the person is sick so they need to continue to take their insulin so we need to make sure that they're taking their insulin taking it on time taking the correct doses not stop it in times of illness but make sure they call their doctor okay so with hyperglycemic hyperosmolar non-ketotic coma not coma I'm sorry syndrome this is um this kind of looks like the person with ketoacidosis. The difference here is that this person um, does not have um, acidosis. Um, we may see this one. This one is more common in your type 2 diabetic, um, the person that has not been diagnosed with diabetes. Um, when these people present, they usually have an extremely high glucose level. It can be anywhere from 600 to 2,000. Um, the person is going to have profound dehydration. Well, we already learned what happens when we have a lot of glucose in our system. It causes us to urinate, right? So this person is extremely dehydrated. Um, and so what we um, have to remember here is that we have got to um, rehydrate this patient. We've got to rehydrate this patient and we have also got to um, make sure we're, we're monitoring the labs because if this person has been dehydrated over a couple of days we know that we lose electrolytes so we've got to make sure the labs are monitored any type of electrolyte replacement that this person requires we're going to make sure that you know those things are going to re be replaced also it's going to be important to assess BUN and creatinine um, of BUN and creatinine on this level on this patient as well because um, of the elevated glucose levels. We read yesterday, learned about the renal threshold. So if we've got um, blood sugar, blood sugars of 600 to 2,000, they may have sustained some type of damage to the kidney. So we've got to do BUN and creatinins. Um, but again, we've got to replace, um, do electrolyte replacement. Um, and this person is also going to be on an insulin drip. So, um, okay. Um, as with the patient with diabetic ketoacidosis, I already talked about the electrolyte replacement, but potassium, sodium, chloride, phosphates, they um, may also be administered to this patient through IV as well. Um, and so, um, I think that's all that I wanted to say about that. Um, with diabetic foot care, um, You've probably read or you've, uh, you're about to read about the different um, complications of diabetes, um, your neuropathies that can um, occur as a result of that, your microvascular and your macrovascular changes that can occur. So diabetic foot care is one of those, um, one of those areas where we have to, you know, we have to learn about it and know what to teach our patients about it. When the um, nerves of the foot have become affected um, through neuropathy, anytime we see Pathy, P A T H Y, that means something is sick, right? So neuro nerves, sick nerves, and so the nerves, the the nerves don't sense the way that they're supposed to, and so if you've got dead nerves in your foot, well then you won't know when you've, you know. You, when you have a cut under the bottom, when you stepped on something that you don't need to, and that's kind of that's what we see with the diabetic patients. Once that neuropathy develops, they may not they um, possibly can't sense when they stepped on something, and so um, it puts them at risk for um, gangrene if, if that foot can become infected, and we. Um, 
see will you know learn that you know they may have to have the foot amputated so what do we teach our patients well we teach them to you know wash their feet on a daily basis with mouth soap and water make sure they're patting them dry um, they can apply you know um, specified lotions or ointments by their doctor um, dry, um, apply them to the feet to prevent drying and cracking um, and so when they cut their toenails, the diabetic patient wants to always cut their toenails straight across. Not trying to get too detailed, going in the curves of the toes because at those at that time we can um pinch skin and cut it. Hold on. Okay. Um, the patient wants to avoid constricting garments such as garters. Um, as I was saying with the toenails, cut the toenails straight across. That's it. Straight across. No, like I said, going in the edges or the little curves of the toes. Don't do that. Um, wear clean, absorbent socks, um, cotton or wool. Make sure that they have properly fitting shoes. Um, never ever 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 go barefoot um, they need to inspect their feet on a daily basis if they notice that they have any cuts or blisters any breaks in the skin they need to notify their doctor um, because as I said um, if the person has nerve damage you know that area can become infected really quickly so we want to make sure that they're keeping an eye on that on a daily basis um, also um, when they're taking baths they want to you know test the test the water on the back on the back of their arm to make sure that the, the water is n not too hot when they're getting in bathtubs um, as far as checkups, it's just a good idea for a diabetic to be checked out on a regular basis. In the book, it talked about um, your glyc glycated um, hemoglobin. Um, some other books call it a glycosylated hemoglobin A1C. Um, this is a, um, a lab that is usually done for diabetic patients to check their um, it, it usually gives an gives a picture of how the person has been monitoring um, or maintaining their blood sugars over the course of 120 days and so for the diabetic patient they want the a1c to be less than um, less than seven um, and so usually um, if the person has um, if the person is controlling their blood sugars they're doing a good job of it um, they may need to have this lab checked um, twice a year but if it's a person that you know they're a little slow um, and the um, A1C is elevated um, they probably will have them to do have the A1C's checked on a quarterly basis. Um, the reason I had eye exams up here is because we kind of I kind of mentioned this on um, the other day when I talked about retinopathy one of those microvascular changes a small vessel um, change that can happen with diabetes and so this is only going to be detected with and uh, with the yearly eye exam and so we want to make sure that pa make sure that our patients are having their eye exams done on a yearly basis um, if you have any questions please email me and I will try my best to answer your questions thank you